Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here. Kevin, what's going on? Not a whole lot, Tom. I recently learned that uh, French chicken, which is a very delicious dish, is actually a different chicken. And I uh, I was surprised. I thought that was just a French restaurant calling it a French chicken, but it's a different type of chicken. What kind, Who of, knew? What kind of chicken is it? Is it like it's a called pig? a French chicken. Oh, like it's, it's, uh, it's a different style, and it takes 70 days as opposed to 35 for your more traditional and I think it's called a cob chicken is the one that most of us eat. Uh, but hey, something new every day, right? Those French. You can't you can't go wrong <laughs> with their food though. It does taste pretty good. <laughs> All right. So we'll uh let's jump into our planning topic and then we'll finish with our with our toss ups, uh a couple couple articles. Um so for the planning topic, one that's uh brought up quite a bit, and that is the Secure Act two point and with that not only means today, but next year and for future years. So we got some more guidance and uh, I think this will be good. So let's, let's jump into it. Kevin, you want to want to kick us off on? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so some of the things we're going to talk about today exist in the rules and you're allowed to do, but not all brokerage companies will be able to execute them. So great example is now you can do a Roth SEP IRA. You can have your matching contributions for a Roth 401k go into the 401k as opposed to the traditional, but it doesn't mean your plan sponsor or that your company is going to do it. So as we go through all this, um, these are now here what's allowed in regulatory. Here's what's allowed legally. Um, it doesn't mean that your company or your firm or the brokerage you work with is going to be able to execute, but I imagine in a short time, they will be able to do all these things. But all the stuff we're talking about today is an impact from Secure Act 2.0. So the first one I want to hit, which is something everybody's going to have to deal with at some point, but now not as soon, which is a change in the RMD ages. So everybody remembers required minimum distributions to get to a certain age and putting tax deferred money in an IRA. They make you take it out. Uh, Uncle Sam wants to get his tax money. It says, you know, before it was 70 and a half, you got to start taking out. Now, if you were born a 1950 year before it's 72 if it's 1951 to 1959 73 and anybody 1960 and later so I'm the end of the baby boomers gen x millennials gen z you don't have to take that money out until 75 and so that provides you a ton of room for things like roth conversions taking out thoughtfully when your tax rate's lowest uh, but really a big change uh, and that kicks off in stages now up until 2033. Yep. And, and just, just for clarification, if you're already taking RMDs to Kevin's point born before those, those, uh, those years, your grandfather in, so you have to continue to take them, but, uh, going forward this year, yep. 73 and in 2033, it's going to be 75, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's, uh, let's say the topic of RMDs. So the penalty for a missed RMD, uh, which was pretty substantial, uh, it was 50% is now getting down, dropped down to 25% and even 10% in, uh, a timely manner if it's corrected. And there's some, some waivers too. So they're being a little bit more flexible for those penalties, but that's, that's one you just don't even want to deal with. It's it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we have systems in place where you hit a certain age, RMDs are calculated automatically and sent out. Yeah, this is really for those that are self-directed, um, you know, be sure that you do it because it used to be really punitive. 50% of what you're supposed to take out was now basically a penalty to the IRS. They've dropped that, like Tom said, which is very helpful. Um, but if you're working an advisor like myself or Tom, we're going to make sure that money comes out. And even if you work with some of those robo advisors, they might just automatically send you a check to make sure. So not a big deal, uh, but if you're doing everything on your own and you don't have a lot of help, you might realize that, okay, well, it's not going to hurt as much. It's still going to hurt. Um, and then they, they shorten the limitation. So if you miss it, you might be able to get away with it, which is okay. kind of funny. Uh, it's the same thing with people who don't file tax returns or owe money. It does eventually expire. It doesn't stay with you forever like college loans, but yeah. Um, the other thing they did, which was something that was kind of stolen from, we'll call it the Fiscal Cliff, which was when they did that one, it was a state 
uh, exemption, that number was indexed for inflation. Going forward, instead of waiting for the IRS every year to tell you, oh, you can increase it by a thousand from six to seven or from seven to eight, it's now going to be just increased by inflation. So much like Social Security increases with cost of living, um, your limits of how much you can contribute is going to go up. And that applies specifically to uh, all contributions, but really the catch-up contributions as well. So instead of being an extra thousand dollars, it might be twelve hundred next year. Now we haven't had a year in which they've done it, so we don't have a guideline of what it's going to be. Uh, we just know what they plan it for it to be. Yep, yep. That'll be nice having that automatic going forward. Uh, another one for small business owners out there. I think this one's huge. Uh, starting this year, SEP and Simple IRAs, which are basically 401k plans for small business owners, are now going to allow Roth options, um, which mm-hmm. you know a lot of 401k providers have already, already allow that. But uh, for now, SEPs and Simple IRAs, you can have a Roth option that both your employer and employees uh, can make contributions to. That's right. And again, I reiterate what I said at the top, which is not everybody's going to have access to it. But let's say you're a small business owner, you have a SEP and you want to do a Roth now because you see the tax rates are supposed to go up after 2025. And so you'd rather pay the taxes now knowing that, hey, for the future, if these tax cuts expire, I'm going to pay a higher rate five years or 10 years when I retire. I want to pay for it now. So try and do it. It'll be helpful. Um, But might not be available. And and just so everyone's clear, you know, with Roth IRAs, um, there's an income limitation where you make a certain amount of income. I think this year it's we'll call it right around two twenty, it starts. Um, adjustable gross income. You cannot make contributions to Roth IRAs, which it's after tax money, gross tax deferred, and all tax free at retirement. Uh, those income limitations do not uh, are not applicable or do not apply for four hundred one Ks or now these SEP and simple IRAs. Yeah. And a great example of that is we're talking about having a few thousand dollars, you know, six or seven, you can put in a traditional Roth IRA with a SEP Roth IRA. The number this year is going to be 69,000. So, you know, 10 X what you were able to do in your traditional Roth IRA that you've been limited to on income. When it comes to the SEP, you're limited only based on what the SEP contribution is, which is, you know, 25% as an employee, it's a little bit less if you're the employer, but that's a huge jump from the five to 7,000, even averaging over the last handful of years. Yeah, that's a good point. And speaking of Roth accounts, uh, employer matching contributions for Roth accounts. So if you have a 401k and you're contributing to your uh, Roth component of the 401k, assuming your plan allows it, uh, historically, the match has to be pre-tax go to the pre-tax bucket by your employer. Now going forward, again, assuming your plan allows it, your employer matching contributions uh, can be made into your Roth. The only caveat is is that you're going to be responsible to pay the tax that year on those contributions uh, or matching contributions into into the Roth 401k. Yeah, which shouldn't be a huge number because typically the matching is only a few thousand dollars as well, but got a plan for that either way. Uh, now, a fun one that always comes up this time of year as kids are going back to school, which is, what if I have money left over in my 529 before you had to take it out or put it to another kid or maybe the next generation? Now, if you've had the same beneficiary for 15 years, uh, and then that person also has qualified income, so this is going to be probably after they finish college as well, you can roll over that money from a 529 into a Roth IRA for the 529 beneficiary. So not the parent, but instead the kid. And these rollovers obviously have the same annual contribution limits, but you know, having seven thousand over five years to do thirty-five thousand at you know twenty-five to thirty, that's a pretty nice nest egg for most average Americans to get started with before they're thirty years old. You know, I think this is a huge one, and you know, I was thinking of kind of some strategies around it. So, like Kevin said, you can roll up to roll out up to thirty five thousand. You have to do it in six or seven thousand dollar increments each year, but. You know, we have a lot of clients that want to start Roth IRAs for the children that are just born. And the IRS says for, to contribute to a Roth IRA, it's up to 6000 or earned income. Well, you know, people have gotten very clever throughout the years on what is considered earned income. You know, I've heard, you know, babies doing modeling pictures, but most children under, you know, call it age 10, don't have earned income. So I think a workaround is to put the money into a 529 plan, let that grow, it can be used for college. And now we know down the road, this can be rolled over into a Roth. So I think this is going to, this is going to create some, some opportunities. And um, it it looks like the direction with 529 plans too, over the years, we see it, they've become, they're getting more and more flexible on what you can do, you know, K through 12, that wasn't, possible, you know, five, 10 years ago. So I think it's going to, it's going in the right trend. And I think there'll be some, some opportunities for that. 
I agree. And I don't know that that 35,000 is going to be indexed for inflation, but if it was, we're talking about a very substantial amount of money and then you compound it over time, uh, it ends up being a whole lot of money. So it's a great thing. And if you overfund a 529, that's okay. Now we have a little start to retirement. So a nice gift for the next generation regardless. So one other area to kind of touch on is qualified charitable distributions. I know that some of my clients do this now. Uh, two great new changes. Number one is that it'll be indexed for inflation. So that's helpful. We can put more towards those. But the other one is, and this is a one-time only option, a $50,000 gift can be made into a charitable gift annuity, a charitable remind, a remainder unit trust, commonly called a CRUT, or a charitable remainder annuity trust, which is a CRAT. So these are things where you can actually gift that money to a charity. You can still get income off of it. Um, and you get that $50,000 to go away from your RMD requirement for that year. So I think this would be really helpful, especially any year, but that first year you have to do it. If you're waiting and say like, okay, well, I'm gonna wait till next April and you have to do two RMDs that year to use that money then to limit how much has to come out and be taxable to you. I think it's a really big opportunity from a planning standpoint and you get to give it away while living. So um, the charity that gets it is gonna know about it. They're gonna get the principal eventually. You get the income in the meantime. It's a really big win-win, but these are complicated legacy planning strategies and estate planning strategies. So I wouldn't do this on your own. I would work with either somebody in a plan giving department or the nonprofit you work with, or uh, you know, Tom and I can help too, but uh, we'd still bring in the big guns to make sure we do it right. Yep, yep. I know we're bouncing all over the place here, but uh, this is one that kind of was really interesting to me going back to the 401ks is that employer matching contributions, and this is for next year, um, are going to be th those contributions that are matching from your employer can be made towards student loan payments. Um, yeah. That, that was uh, that was very different. So instead of investing, <laughs> you know, that's. I got to really look into that one. And I think it's on a case by case basis, but that's when you got to really weigh your, you know, where are you going to get your best bang for your buck and the best return? If you got student loan payment, that's got a 10 plus percent interest rate, then maybe it makes the most sense. But um, that one was just, uh, was, was, was kind of unique. All right. I got two more before we move on to our next segment. First one is in 2026, ABLE plans, which are uh, tax managed plans for people who have disabilities, uh, that disability can now onset to age 46 as opposed to previously it was 26. So when it was 26, you had people with downs or autism or other kind of things like that. And you set up these plans. And the reason for those plans is that those people typically get benefits from Social Security Administration. And if they have too much income, well, that can cause a problem for their benefits they get from the federal or state governments. Uh, with these ABLE plans, you can create kind of a nice reserve fund for somebody with that situation to make sure that they're taken care of, but then they don't own the assets themselves. So it was a very much simplified way to have a special needs trust. Um, it was much like a 529. So uh, that's going to be one big change coming up, not next year, but the year after. And the last one is it's say you don't have an employer or if you do and they don't provide a match, get ready for low income individuals. There's going to be something from the federal government called the savers match, which will offer a match of 50% of contributions that go into an IRA or 401k up to $2,000 a year. So let's say your employer isn't so generous or you're self-employed. Let's say you drive for Uber or you do something like that and you set up an IRA for yourself. Well, now the federal government's got to $2,000 is going to give you a 50% bonus uh, of matching funds. So um, a lot of income restrictions. I'm sure it won't be, you know, that common for everybody, but you know, everybody thinks retirement's you know important, and let's get more people doing it. Yeah, what does that what does that tell you? Does it does it maybe smell like Social Security may be going away down the road? I don't know. They're starting to really uh, pump up these savings plans for individuals. I'm just, I think that I'm just maybe, kidding. maybe some relief for Social Security. <laughs> I, I think Social Security will be there. I have no I, doubts about that. I, I don't know so how much it will be taxable, how much I'll get to keep, um, but it'll be there. Just yeah. like I've told all my clients. So. All right. Um, Let's move on to toss up. All right, Tom, you want me to kick it off or you want to ask the first one here? Yeah, it's kind of complicated. Um, you can, you can kick, you can, you can ask the first one. All right. So wealth taxes are uh, back in the narrative, whether it's a newspaper or the campaign trail. Um, Thomas Piketty wrote the definitive book on capital a number of years ago, um, but in it, he has some prescriptions for some of the problems. One of which is he suggests that billionaires should be taxed on their wealth at a 90% rate after the first $2 billion. Now he argues that we could do that, then we could cut taxes for everyone else. So for example, in Texas, we have high property taxes, almost 3% in some communities. You'd be able to just get 
get rid of that completely for most of the middle and upper middle class because the top 0.01% is going to pay for everything. Um, nice idea, right? So the toss up, Tom, is just that should there be a maximum wealth allowed? Is $2 billion enough billion? Wow. First off, 3% property tax. I don't know what community you're living in, but uh, nice one. Yeah, I, I can tell. Um, so I think this is ridiculous. Uh, one, I would love to see the math behind it. I mean, he says that if you tax 90% of anyone over 2 billion, that will cut out taxes for uh, for property tax for the middle and upper class. Sounds nice, but does the math add up? I, I, I don't know. I'd like to see the, uh, the math behind it. Uh, listen, that is so de- incentivizing to anyone, you know, does, does Jeff Bezos become Jeff Bezos? Does Elon Musk become Elon Musk? If they're giving away 2 billion, is not enough, Tom, 90% You're not start Amazon for only 2 billion instead of a hundred billion, 90%. Uh, I think that's aggressive. I think the estate tax and wealth transfer different story, but for money that people started from the ground up, man, that's how this world works in my opinion. So I think there could be some sort of tax, but 90% that's, that's very aggressive. Maybe 10, 20, very 30, aggressive. maybe even 50, but 90. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it raises a couple of questions. Number one is, could it be done? Um, and people said the same thing about the corporate tax rate internationally being, you know, increased to a global minimum and they were able to get that done. So I do think it's possible that this could be enacted. Um, so that's step one. Cause if you did that in the United States, they'd all just leave for another country. Right. But if you do it with enough of the good countries that people want to live in, well, maybe actually you do capture all that, which is, an interesting story. Um, but I think, and this is the, the real answer here for me, which is sounds nice in theory, you know, let everybody else pay for it. But I think the reality is politicians would still spend more than what they take in. Yep. Um, and I don't think that they would be using it as efficiently as somebody like Elon Musk or other people on the Forbes list. Uh, so I'd rather them keep their wealth. And I think they'll be better stewards than some guy we elected from, you know, no, we got $2 trillion deficit. So yeah, you can increase revenue by taxes or here's an idea. You can cut spending. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't cut spending. Tom, how am I supposed to win an election if I have to cut spending? No, people want to hear how much I'm going to spend on them, not take away. It's, it's, I will, well, let's, let's, let's change topics before I get, before I get angry. Uh, all right, Save Kevin, long, longevity is a hot area for investment. People are probably living longer and several blue zones of centurions around the world. One man, David Asprey, thinks human can push their lifespan to 140 while plans to live to 180, taking extreme measures. So how are you taking this road to longevity? Doing the old fashioned way, using stairs, getting fresh air, spending time with friends and family, or are you taking on a new fads, gene therapy, ice baths, I don't know what blood washing is, but blood washing. <laughs> well, there's a lot of money going into gene therapy. And obviously we've seen all the memes about ice baths and all the people on reels doing that for sure. Now, just to comment on the blood washing. So that is where you get somebody younger to donate their plasma. So let's say you're in college and you don't have any money. Well, you can donate your plasma from your blood to Tom. He's going to go spin that around, put it in his body. And allegedly that might help with your longevity of keeping you and your blood younger. Uh, it was properly made fun of in Silicon Valley, which was a show on a few years ago. Uh, for me, these latest fads are uh, not for me. Uh, so I'll just go out in the fresh air, go on a few walks, spend some time with friends, and maybe at some point I'll start watching my diet a little bit better. But uh, these... I like the tried and true stuff a lot more than freezing myself off in Wim Hof style or Give... gene therapy. Uh, it's terrifying. No, that blood washing sounds kind of cool. I, I'm, 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 th- I'm taking the, the, the ladder. Um, as long okay, as, as, as long as, let me just, let me just break it to you. As long as we live in the U S between all the, all the shit and crap that's in our food, uh, you know, you, you, you look at these blue zones. I mean, they're all, most of them, I don't think there's any in the U S I could be wrong. Um, there's one there is, I mean, but most of them are in, are overseas and they're in places that just have like Italy. Italy, I think has the largest concentration of, of blue zones. Um, I saw a documentary on it a couple of years ago, but you know, it's, 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 eating real food that's, that's grown in your backyard and having a great diet and being able to walk. And the U S is just not conducive to that. Yeah. Well, there's a seven day Adventist in Southern California. That's the only one in the U S then there's one in Costa Rica and Nosara. Um, and there's a few others in Japan and Italy and uh, other places. But, um, now for me, I think the gene therapy is interesting for some diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, some of the dementia stuff, or if you have something that's genetic and you can go in and edit that out. 
I think that that's potentially like life changing, obviously, but, you know, even beyond your own life, the next generations to fix some of those problems. I think it's pretty helpful. Uh, I'd like to see more. Uh, I don't want to be the guinea pig on this stuff, but I do think that this is an opportunity to have a higher quality of life in later age. But I don't know, living to 140 and 180, uh, you know, it sounds interesting just to see all the stuff that happens, but I have a feeling that most of my friends wouldn't be here. Uh, I, I don't know that I, I think I'm a man of my era, Tom. Well, I look back at history and go, I, I don't know if I would have made it through that time. Yeah. It was kind of rough. It'll be interesting doing financial planning with having the new time horizon at 140 and 180. It'll change it. Yeah. What's retirement age? 125? Yeah. <laughs> you got to work a hundred years for the last 35. Yep. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Tom, let's move on to something a little more current, but also deals with somebody who's trying to extend their own longevity. Warren Buffett and his Berkshire cash pile. So they recently were in the news. He cut his stake in Apple by 400 million shares, still the largest holding in the portfolio. They still have another 400 million shares. So it's not like they gave up on the company, but who knows next quarter when they release how many they have left. They also cut down holdings in Bank of America and a few others. Uh, they now have cash equivalents. So it could call it cash, but it's likely in T-bills. 277 billion up from 130 billion back in May of 2023. So that's a pretty big balance sheet. Uh, yeah. My question to you and the toss up is what's Warren going to do with all that cash? He's just going to hoard it. Is he going to buy another huge company, a bunch of small companies or like he has been doing, you know, just buy back their own stock. You know, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of media around this about Warren calling a, calling a top or he doesn't, he, he just buys good companies and holds on to them. That's been his, philosophy from from day one um and he does what he what he's always done he's sells high and buys low he's owned apple for a long time it's got high valuations and to your point he's just trimming back and what does he do with all that cash i think he's gonna get ready to to buy other companies um he, i think he's gonna do all the above buy other companies buy stock back um i don't know does berkshire or hathaway uh yeah they, they, they issue a dividend uh, maybe yeah. they don't maybe he'll maybe he'll start a dividend i don't know um distribute some of that cash. But uh, I think I think he's getting ready to, to take over a couple of companies and just getting a stockpile of cash and waiting for a good opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I think the cash right now, I don't have today's market cap, but it's around a third of the total value of the company. Yeah. So I think it's, I yeah, if, they, yeah. if they could do a tender offer for a 10th of it or, you know, 15% of it, that seems like a good use. And they're still spending off a lot of cash. I mean, Apple does pay dividends. So they do the, that. They get, you know, Bank of America, some of their other holdings all pay dividends. So they're going to keep piling up cash. They also have float of over $165 billion from their insurance operations. So they need some of that to pay all the claims, but <clears throat> $300 billion almost is a lot. So I, I think it'd be fun to go through the shopping list of companies around that size that it could buy. I don't know how much cash you want to keep, but, you know, I, I think they'd have a regulatory problem. So if you go start scooping up two or three, you know, 50, 75, $100 billion companies, Somebody's going to say something like, all right, enough. You own well, too many things. He's been buying Occidental over the last year in five to 10% increments, and he owns about 60% of Occidental. Um, so I think he's just does what he does. He's going to continue just selecting a few companies that he thinks are undervalued and just start, start buying them up. Yeah, I think if there's an industry he'll go after, it'll be in utilities. I think that he doesn't have a great understanding of technology by his own admission, but I think he'll understand the power usage and say, I'm going to buy, you know, a NextEra or an Exelon or one of these companies that stands to benefit from increased usage of, like, of utilities. And they already got a bunch of utilities in the portfolio. So I think that would be a nice little bolt on acquisition, but I'm not sure who's making the decisions over there. Right. So he's, you know, Charlie Munger's gone. Um, you know, he's not going to live forever. Does he want to leave on a swan song, <laughs> swan song of, you know, one last, you know, hurrah, or does he want to leave a big cash pile to the next generation of managers and let them figure out what to do with it? Yeah, so it'll, we'll it'll be interesting. Um, all right. So next one, which we've tackled before, working from home, uh, Fridays appear to not exist in the office. Mondays may, he may be headed to the living room as well. Um, does this end at a four day work week? Five, less. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it depends on where you live. So I think if you're in the Northeast New York area, I think there's going to be a push to get five days in the office again. I think the pushback will be so strong they might settle at four, but I think there's going to continue to push for five. But if you're in other places, you know, out on the West Coast, you know, maybe no days in the office, maybe one or two days in the office, maybe you have a partial office. So I think if you look at the, the map of the country over here, you got New York over here, California. I think as you go across, you'll have less days of the week in the office. I think Dallas, Texas and, uh, you know, Austin, Houston, 
I, I've seen at least three days from people and it also depends on the industry, right? So some of them it's different, but it is an ongoing thing. And every week there seems to be another article about, okay, Black Rocks are crying four and they pushed for five, but all the employees revolted or, you know, this company wants to have five days and they all, they all revolted too and can't get that. So I, the fight's ongoing. I think people said commutes are terrible. I don't want to do this anymore. So I think the longer commuting cities, it's going to be uh, less days in the office. Yep. Yep. I agree. I like that uh, that that chart of going from west to east. I agree with that. Yeah. All right. Last one, Tom. So elections, we, we've talked about this a few times because they are always in the news. Um, but this one's pertinent now because I think the recent sell off could be somewhat related to our own election. So we saw this year Mexico and France around their elections. They either sold off prior or right afterwards. The U.S., we've got a big one. A, can't can't go. I mean, I get messages from random numbers encouraging me to vote and register and give money. It's unavoidable. So we'll, we'll talk about it here. But just to say that I think that right now we might be in the midst of a correction uh, in equity markets. You know, we had a big bump after Trump's assassination attempt where it seemed like he was definitely going to win the election. We saw stock market basically at the all time highs the same day as polling peaked. And now there's been a repricing from the possibility that Kamala Harris becomes a Democratic nominee. I think that both things are about regulatory environment and taxes. One stands for one side, one on the other side. Um, but the real question for investors and advisors is this toss up, which is, do you just write out these fluctuations or are elections a unique opportunity that we should be trading around? Yeah, you know, before I jump into that, I'll just touch on what you said. You know, I was looking at a chart that Bespoke put out about the uh, the market and the GOP odds, and they both bottomed um, together <laughs> it, back in back in April, and they went up in lockstep. And since Kam Kamala took uh, took over, um, they've gone both have gone straight down the odds of GOP and as well as the the market. Um, so to answer your question, I think that I think the elections and the market are just o overblown in my opinion. And typically, what you see is when you have when you have uh, the sitting president, if he takes term. And this not going to be the case this time. And uh, Trump has already been the president. So I think it's all out of whack. So I think don't even think we can look back at history because the markets don't like surprises. So if the sitting president's going to get another four years, the market tends to do well about a month heading into election. And oddly enough, whether it's a new sitting president or another four years, the market has gone up in both December, uh, both November and December uh, historically in, in uh, presidential election year. So I think there'll be some volatility either way. You're going to see a knee jerk reaction. I think it's a good time if you see a market sell off to, to invest. But to your point, I think there's I think there's other things on the horizon that the market's uh, more fearful of than than who's going to be in, in Washington. Yeah, I think uh, that it's a unique opportunity if there's a lot of stress that comes out of it, whether it's Argentina or some of the other places you go, oh, I might put a little bit of money to work there. Uh, here in the U.S., if you have some cash on the sidelines and you know, I'm not saying take a whole lot in or out just to say, you know, I would anticipate if this wasn't the only correction, there could be another one before November or right after November. Uh, typically, right after these elections is a pretty positive outcome. So it's a good time to be adding. Um, yeah, you know, but this doesn't have to do with the election. But Bespoke also just put out a chart the other day about any time that the market's been up greater than ten percent through the first half of the year. I think for over the last thirty years, there's been almost a hundred percent chance that the market was up the second half of the year, and by a significant amount. And that's just because of momentum and uh, what, what's taking place right now. So I think there's a lot of seasonality that's going to come into to play and what goes on with the Fed next month and in December. So there's a, I think if there's going to be some volatility for sure. And to your point, any, any sell-offs um, I think could be, could be an opportunity. Yeah. Well, thanks Tom. I uh, think we'll probably have to talk about central banks in the next recording. Might get our first cuts uh, in September. So let's get excited for that episode. All right. Thanks Kevin. You've been listening to your money momentum brought to you by global wealth advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum.
All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.